Hello and good evening and how the flippity fuck are you? And I can't swear because it's very early in the stream and we have to be good boys early on. I don't know why it's just those things. But here we are and who's in chat? We have a Wolfenstone. Good evening, Wolfenstone. How the fuck are you? Yes, here I am. Did you like uh, my Ice Cream Man song? This is my little intro song. I like it very much. Goes with my ice cream van, which is uh, just there. Anyway, let's get straight on with some pigment pushing. Going to sound pugnacious. Isn't this Coughlin the guy you're looking today. at for the murder of the girl? Mr. Anderson, I think I'd better come see you in person, Davis says. Oh, God, he says, sounding younger than ever. That one. What time would be convenient? I guess I could be at the office. There now. Have you got the address? We're in Cathcart. I have it. Okay, tell Truth me is me pretty much a one-man operation. Seven, Just tell me one thing, ma'am. Did I break the law when I printed his name? Not to my knowledge, Davis says. It wasn't illegal, just shitty. I'll be by this afternoon. Skin tones. 46. Danny doesn't know what his next stop will be. Maybe Denver, maybe Longmont, maybe Arvada. But after nearly three years in Oak Grove, his two small suitcases won't be enough for the belongings he means to take. He decides to go to Manitou Fine Liquors and see if he can get some empty boxes for his clothes. They might not know his face there, because even in his drinking days he stuck mostly to beer. He opens his trailer door shortly after noon and stops on the top step. Darla Jean Richardson has set up her dollhouse on the asphalt in the shade of the Oak Grove office building. It's a big one, damn near a mansion. Is that a bit Carrying better? it from her I trailer must have been a chore. Becky ordered it from Amazon for DJ's seventh birthday, then threw up Shall her hands in there? despair when she realized it had to be assembled. Danny put it together with DJ handing him the various components, both of them singing along with the radio. No, great. That was a That's good a day. She's nine now, and he hasn't seen Marigold's dream house for almost a year. He supposes she plays with it in her bedroom or has outgrown it, but if she lugged it all the way out here from her trailer, it can only have been for one reason. Hey, DJ, what do you say? It's always been good for a smile, but not today. She gives him a solemn look. She's gone, if that's why you were staying inside. Danny doesn't have to ask who DJ's talking about. Ella Davis was in the park earlier, knocking on doors and talking to anyone who was home. He expected her to make a visit to his trailer, but she never did. Just took off her COVID mask and left. Where's your mom? She had to take Mariel's shift at the diner. Mariel's got M P T I G. DJ says the word very carefully, syllable by syllable. She said I could stay on my own. I can't make bring me back a slice of cake. My is as loud as it goes. I don't want cake. I, I can make I don't book care a little if quieter. I ever have cake again. So make your mind up. She told me I couldn't knock on your door, so I came here, so I'd see you when you came out. Danny goes down the steps, walks half the distance to DJ, then stops. The dollhouse is open on its hinges, and he can see Barbie and Ken inside, sitting to at the fair, kitchen table. I've got the book going Barbie tonight, sits so with her I legs stuck bunker, awkwardly out because her knees don't bend it, very well. There was a time when DJ and Danny discussed this and other unrealistic attributes of various dolls, plastic skin, creepy hair, at some length. Why are you just standing there? DJ asks. Because he can feel eyes, of course. The accused killer and the defenseless little girl. Most people are at work, but some are at home. The ones Inspector Davis talked to, and they will be watching. Maybe he shouldn't care, but he does. Before he can think of a reply, she says, Ma asked if you ever molested me. I know what that means. It means stranger danger. And I said Danny would never molest me because he's my friend. Darla Jean starts to cry. D 
DJ. Jesus, don't. You didn't kill that girl, did you? Not a question. Fuck the watchers. He goes to where she's sitting and squats down beside her. No, they think I did because I had a dream of where she was buried, but I didn't kill her. DJ swipes an arm across her eyes. Ma says I can't come over your trailer anymore and you can't pick me up at school anymore. She says they'll either arrest you or you'll go away. Are they going to arrest you? They can't because I didn't do anything wrong. Are you going away? I have to. I don't have a job, and most people don't want me here anymore. I want you. What if Ma decides she wants Bobby for a boyfriend again? He can't fix the car if it busts. I hate him. He sent me to my room once without my supper, and Ma didn't stop him. She begins to sob and double fuck the watchers. Danny puts Danny an arm around her and pulls her to him. Stick her face him against his shirt is hot and wet, but okay. While. More than okay. She won't have Bob back, he says. She knows better. He has no idea if this is true, but hopes it is. He's never met his predecessor. For all Danny knows, he could be a skinny, bespectacled accountant who gets a kick out of sending little girls to their rooms. But he imagines a Big hulk with a crew cut and lots of tattoos. Someone a little girl could really be scared of. Take me with you, DJ says against his shirt. Danny laughs and gives her dark blonde hair a scruff. Then they'd arrest me for sure. She looks up at him and gives him a tentative smile. That's when Althea Dumfries comes out of her trailer. Let loose of that child, she shouts. Let loose of that child this minute, or I'm calling the police. DJ shoots to her feet, tears still streaming down her face. Go fuck yourself! Go fuck yourself, you fat bitch! Danny is horrified, but also admiring. And even though he's sure Darla Jean just bought herself a whole boatload of trouble, he can't help thinking that he couldn't have said it better himself. 47. Ella Davis didn't think they made bergs like Cathcart anymore, even in dead red central Kansas. It's a dusty one stoplight town about 40 miles north of Manitou. There's a quick shop across from the rusty water tower. Welcome to Cathcart, where all lives matter, is printed on the side. Davis buys herself an RC and grabs a plane's truth from the rack by the cash register. Danny Coughlin has made the front page, sandwiched between an ad for Royal Tires and one for the discount furniture warehouse where every day is sale day. The headline reads, Suspect Claims It Was All a Dream. Davis cranks up the A.C. in her car and reads the story before heading down Main Street. It's Peter Anderson's byline. Excepting local sports, Anderson seems to write all the Plains Truth stories, and Davis doesn't think the New York Times will be calling him any time soon. If Anderson's intent was irony, he fell far short, achieving only a kind of lumbering skepticism. Perversely, it makes her want to believe Danny's version. She tosses the miserable excuse for a newspaper behind her. Plain's Truth is on the street-level floor of a white frame building halfway down Main Street. It's squeezed between a dollar tree and a long, defunct western auto. It needs paint. The boards are loose, the nails bleeding streaks of red rust. The door is locked. She cups her hands to peer through the window and sees one large, cluttered room with an old desktop computer presiding over it like an ancient god. The chair in front of the computer looks new, but the rest of the furniture looks like it was picked up either at a yard sale or on a dump-picking safari. The long bulletin board is drifted deep with ad mock-ups and old copy, some of it yellowed and curling with age. Hello, 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 are you Davis? She turns to behold a very tall young man, perhaps six, seven, or eight. He's as skinny as a playing card 
He's also strikingly pale at a time of year when most Kansans have at least a touch of tan. A Hitlerian forelock of black hair hangs over one eye. He brushes it back and it flops back down. I am, she says. Hold on, hold on, I'll unlock. He does so and they step in. She smells air freshener and beneath it, a ghost aroma of pot. I was down street to see Ma. She's got the diabetes. Lost a foot last year. Would you like a cold drink? I think there's some in the... She holds up her bottle of RC. Oh, right, right. Okay, great. As for snacks, I'm afraid the cupboard is bare. <laughs> he laughs. It titters, actually, and brushes away the forelock. It promptly falls back. I'm sorry it's so warm in here. The air conditioning's on the fence. Always something, isn't it? We roll the rock. Sisyphus and all that. Davis has no idea what he's talking about, but she realizes he's scared to death. Good. I didn't come here for snacks. No, of course not. Coughlin. The story about Coughlin. Two stories, it turns out. Two, yes, right, okay. As I sit on the phone, I thought I was getting information from someone on the inside of the investigation. A policeman. In fact, he said that. KHP, he said. Not KBI? The Kansas Bureau of Invest... No, no, he was from the Highway Patrol. I'm sure, totally sure, positive. The forelock flops. Anderson brushes it back. He also gave you the information about the dream? Yes, sure did. Absolutely, even suggested I withhold that for my next issue. He said I'd still be scooping the regular newspapers. I thought that was a very good idea. Do you usually take advice from anonymous tipsters, Mr. Anderson? He gives the unsettling titter. Davis could more easily envision this man killing Yvonne than Coughlin. In a TV show, he would turn out to be a serial killer with some strange alias like The Reporter. I rarely get tips, Ms. Davis. We're basically an ad-based inspector, Davis, she corrects, not because she's in love with her title, but because she wants him to remember who has the hammer here. Asking again, did I print anything that wasn't true, Inspector Davis? I'm not at liberty to say, and it's not the point. Although what you did was so irresponsible that I'd have trouble believing it if I hadn't read it myself. Now, now, that's a little... I don't suppose you have a recording of this mystery call, do you? She doesn't hold out much hope of that. He gives her a wide-eyed look and another unsettling titter. I record everything. She thinks she must have misheard. Everything? Really? Every phone in? I have to. This is a shoestring operation, Ms. Inspector. I also work part-time at the lumber yard outside of town. You must have passed it on your way in. Wolf Lumber? She can't remember if she did or not. She was thinking about Jalbert. She gestures for Anderson to go on. While I'm out at the yard or seeing to Ma, she takes a lot of seeing to. Every call I get, most of them are about ads, but some are from Herd Conway, he does the sports, are recorded and zipped directly up to the cloud. You don't erase them? He titters. Why would I bother? Plenty of room on the cloud. Many mansions, as the good book says. My soul hath elbow room. Shakespeare. Our setup might not work for a big city newspaper, but it's fine for us. Here, I'll show you. Anderson wakes up his computer and types in a you password. That that you put Davis the, is uh, far from a compulsive neatnik, type, but the desktop screen is so littered with icons that looking at it makes her eyes hurt. Anderson mouses to the phone icon and pushes it. A message blares from speakers on either side of the room. He winces and turns down the volume. You have reached Plains Truth, the voice of central Kansas and the best buy for your ad dollar. We are a free news and sports weekly, sometimes bi-weekly, that is given out free of charge in over 6,000 locations in six counties. If that's true, I'll eat my shorts, Ella thinks. If you have news, press 5. If you have a sports score, press 4. If you want to report an accident, press 3. If you want to place an ad, press 2. If you have a question about rates, push 1. That's 5 for news, 4 for sports, 3 for an accident report, 2 to place an ad, 1 for rates. And don't worry about getting cut off. There's the titter she's coming to know all too well. This is Plains Truth, where the truth matters.
Anderson turns to her. It's good, don't you think? Oh, cool. All yeah, the bells and whistles. Base is covered. Are you doing the band? The band Under too? other circumstances, Davis, curious by nature, might ask Anderson how much ad revenue Plains Truth generates. Planning on doing the orc, uh, not under these. Rock band. Can you find that anonymous call? Yes, sure. Tell me the date I'm searching for. She doesn't know. Try between June 30th and July 4th. Anderson brings up a file. That's a lot of incoming, but maybe. He frowns. The forelock flops. Some guy called in about a chimney fire. I think it was after that. Pretty sure. Anderson clicks, listens, shakes his head, clicks some more. You won't get the band. At last he gets a enough. drawly farmer type who says he's seen a chimbley fire out on Farm Road 17. Anderson gives Davis a thumbs up and goes to the next message. She has drawn up a chair next to him. I suppose that they, it sounds that funny the way you because, paint, you know, your style of painting, you probably Anderson wouldn't. draws a finger across his lips, zipping them shut. It does sound funny because the caller was using a voice-altering device, maybe a vocoder. It sounds like a man, oh, cool. then a woman, That sounds like fun. Then a Something man like again. the, uh... Is it the Boyards of Revenge, the Empress Champion one? I'm not investigating the Yvonne Wicker murder, but I've seen the reports. Your readers might like to know the man who discovered the body is Daniel M. Coughlin. He's a janitor at Wilder High School. He lives in the Oak Grove trailer park. I never printed the address, Anderson says. I thought that would be, shh, go back. Anderson flinches and does something with his mouth. Wilder High School. He lives in the Oak Grove the trailer park in the town of Manitou. You should print that right away. There's a pause. He is KBI's prime suspect because he claims he had a dream of where the body was. The investigators don't believe him. You might want to save that for a follow-up. Just a suggestion. There's another pause. Then the vocoder voice says, Fifteen. Goodbye. There's a click, followed by someone who wants Plains Truth to know that July 4th festivities in Wilder County have been postponed until the 8th. Very sorry. Anderson kills the sound and looks at Davis. Are you nice. okay, ma'am? Just face off with a knob in a yes, primary. Yes, she says. Cool. She's not. She's sick to her stomach. Play it again. Were you listening she to Chris Rose's stream yesterday when he wouldn't say knob? It's so fucking funny. 48. It's the name of the fucking Back in her car, with the air conditioning on high, I mean, this family Davis friendly, listens to it again. Which obviously mine isn't. Then she turns then off her phone and stares through the windshield at Cathcart's oh, dusty Main Street. Knob, right? It's just a word. She's thinking of Deal an arson it. case she worked with Jalbert in the spring. It was in a rural town called Lindsborg. On their way to the site, they passed a field where a few cows were grazing. Ella, riding shotgun that day, Counted them aloud, just for something to do. Seven, she said. Twenty-eight, Chalbert replied, with no pause. She gave him a questioning look, and he told her one to seven added up to twenty-eight. He said adding inclusively passed the time and also kept him mentally sharp. She thought her partner might have a little touch of OCD. She'd even looked up the name of that particular compulsion on her phone, then dismissed it. Everyone had their little tics, didn't they? She herself couldn't go to sleep until all the dishes I mean, you know, were washed and put own, away. It says stream so she had never want, considered counting know, It just seems a little them. bit too much Now to sitting me, in her car, she thinks of Peter Anderson's outgoing message. Five choices. And when you added Each one, to own, two, yeah. three, four, five, the total was... And I'm definitely not 15, in a position where I can tell other people says, how they should stream. I'm it crying was him. In your ear. Fuck. Fuck. She sits a while longer, trying to convince herself that she's wrong. She can't do it. Absolutely can't. So she calls Troop C of the Kansas Highway Patrol, identifies herself, and asks for a callback from Trooper Calton as soon as possible. While she waits for the call back, which she dreads, she asks herself what she's going to do with what she now knows. 49. Danny gets all the empty boxes he wants at Manitou Fine Liquors. He also gets a fifth of Jim Beam. 
At four o'clock that afternoon, the boxes are piled up in his bedroom, and the bottle of beam is on the kitchen table. He sits there looking at it with his hands folded in front of him. He's trying to think of the last time he drank whiskey. Not on the night he got arrested for standing on Margie's lawn and shouting at her house. That night he'd been beard up. He'd downed almost a case of Coors between Manitou and Wichita. He could still remember vomiting it up into the stainless steel toilet of the cell they put him in, then going to sleep not on the bunk but underneath it, as if sleeping on concrete was some kind of penance. He decides the last time he got into the high-tension stuff was fishing with Deke Mathers. The two of them were so loaded they didn't find their way out to Route 327 until it was almost dark. By then, both of them badly hung over and promising never again, never again. He didn't know how that had worked out with Deke. Danny had lost touch with him since moving to Oak Grove, but he hadn't touched brown liquor since. Well, I suppose Not any context, beer for the last couple of years either. It is a reference Jim Beam to won't solve his problems. He English knows that. And specifically He'll still be there when he gets so up on English Tuesday people. morning, only with a hangover to add to his misery. But what it would do is to blot out DJ's sad face, at least for a while. She said, what if Ma decides she wants Bobby for a boyfriend again? She said, he can't fix the car if it busts. Plus, of course, I went to school with a kid whose last said, name was Nobs. And somehow this was the worst the of all. God knew why. All the time. I don't want cake. I don't care if I ever have cake again. That dream, he says. That fucking goddamn dream. Only the dream isn't really the problem. Jalbert is the problem. Jalbert has sprayed his goddamn life with his version of Agent Orange. He's trying to poison everything, including a little girl who thought her life was pretty much okie dokie. Her mom finally had a boyfriend Darla Jean liked who didn't shout and send her from the table without her supper. Jalbert. All Jalbert. Danny unscrews the cap, tips the bottle toward himself, takes a good long sniff. He remembers how he and Deke Mathers laughed there on the riverbank, everything fine. And he remembers how they cursed as they shoved through that final blackberry tangle to the road, getting all scratched up and sweating <laughs> into those scratches, making the sting even worse. Did everyone call him Dicky? Jalbert would love you to get drunk, he thinks. Get drunk and do something stupid. He goes into the bathroom, pours the whiskey into the toilet, and flushes it away. Then he starts packing his clothes into boxes. He can't beat Jalbert except by leaving, so that's what he's going to do. He'll get to spend time with Stevie, who knows Dick where Dick. everything is in the <laughs> Table Mesa King Supers. As for Darla Jean, oh, she'll have to find her way. In the end, most uh, kids do. So he tells himself. Tricky, tricky, dicky, dick, dick. Fifty. I'm not angry, Jalbert thinks as he drives back to his hotel in Lyons. Just upset. The meeting in Wichita didn't go well. He argued for taking Coughlin in. Forty-eight hours, he said. We can call it protective custody. Just let me sweat him. I'll break him down. He's ready. I know it. Protective custody from who? That was Tishman, the director in charge. Neville, the assistant director, sat next to him, nodding like a puppet. The killer? Coughlin doesn't claim to know him. He only claims to know where the body was because of the dream he had. Jalbert asked those in attendance, including Ramsey, the stolid, closed-mouthed detective from Oklahoma, if any of them believed Coughlin's dream story. The unanimous belief was that no one did. Coughlin was the killer, but with no confession and no physical evidence tying him to the crime. And so on. Chalbert needs to do some counting. That would settle him. With a clear head, he'll be able to decide on his next move. When he gets back to the hotel, he'll run the chairs, take a shower, dick, dick, dick. and call Ella. Maybe she's picked up a lead at the trailer park. <laughs> or possibly Coughlin has given something away, but probably not. Oh, 
Fuck you, darling. He's a sly one. Got rid of the Not drugs, didn't rats. he? But he's paying a price. Green he's out of a job, and his neighbors have turned against him. He's got to be angry, and angry people make mistakes. Ooh, gonna need a shake, Jesus. But I'm not angry, just upset. And why? <laughs> Mikey's not because a kid. He well, did it. a lot and of kids do are, it again. Mate. Don't they see that? He asks and bangs on the steering wheel. Are they really that blind? There's a kid in answer. Our they are not. Year at school. Every video was, feed uh, between Arkansas City where Miss Yvonne spent her nine. last night After we'd left here, and the uh, gas and go where she was last seen has been checked. Several tundras were spotted, but none God, were white and all were newer than Danny's. Always had a candle hanging off his nose. I mean, it must have been three inches. Her. As long as somebody... I mean, it's hanging down from his nostril down his lip. That's why we didn't find any DNA or Three-inch candle. Clever. So clever. Jalbert began... Ella did too, Sorry if they by believing that Danny wanted either to be a media star or to confess. Ella may still believe those things, but Jalbert no longer does. Wobble. It's a game to him. He's sticking it in our faces and saying, prove it, prove it, arrest me, arrest me, ha ha, you can't, can you? You know my story is bullshit and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. We had a kid called Neil Jalbert bangs the steering wheel he's... again. Weird Fifteen kid, years right? ago, I mean, proper weird even kid. ten, it was a different playing field with Eve. different rules. Coughlin would have been in a little it, it room like, with Jalbert and Davis, I don't know what they, and they'd what it would sweat be him until like he gave it up. Years at school, ten hours, it was what was twelve, third year it wouldn't when I was matter. a kid. Turn and turn about, whap, and whap, comes whap. To school. They were advocates after for poor Miss Eva, and all the girls would be faster. They'd go at him tirelessly in a room with no clock. who never did nothing. You have so to be hungry. Give us something and we'll send and someone out for chow. Break your arm, mate. You like Burger King? Apparently, There's one right up the street. Tree. Whopper, fries, chocolate shake. How does that like sound? Computers At least tell us when you buried her. Day he got his night. own plaster cast and no. a hammer out of the okay. sort of woodwork Let's start again. and smashed his From plaster cast up so he could fucking type. Like that. Jalbert begins counting barns and Absolute silos loser. and farmhouses to pass the time. He's up to 23, which added in arithmetical progression totals 276 when his phone rings. It's Ella. He expects her to ask how it went in Wichita, but she doesn't. Instead, she asks when he expects to get back to his hotel. Her voice is clipped and tight. She hardly sounds like herself. Could it be excitement? Because she has something. Just a thread, that's all I ask. We'll follow it. We'll follow it all the way through hell, if that's what it takes. I should be there in 40 minutes. What have you got? I'm on the road from Manitou now. I'll meet you there. Come on, give. He runs his hand through the peninsula of his hair. Did Coughlin tell you something? Not on the phone. Make that half an hour. I swear, if it had been available, up. if it had been, like, around at the time, you'd have thought he was, like, that Sheldon from Big Bang Theory. Ella is waiting in the lobby when Frank comes in. She dreads the impending conversation, but will do what has to be done. It would be worse if she liked Frank. She's tried to do that and failed, but until the last couple of days, she respected him. In a way, she respects him still. He is fiercely dedicated to the job, to getting justice for the you woman he that? calls so, uh, poor Miss Yvonne. It's, it's called... just that his dedication has crossed a line, Rotten and when flesh. it did, it turned into something else. He gives her a smile, I showing I like those it. eroded teeth that really need caps. The thick triangle of his widow's peak is disarranged, as if he's been running a hand through it, perhaps pulling at it. Let's go to my so-called suite. It's not great. The only view is of the parking lot, but it fits the expense account. Ella follows. She doesn't know why he's formed such a fierce connection with the wicker girl. Or is it Coughlin he's made a connection with? But she knows it's put pressure on some fundamental crack in his personality. What was once a hairline is now a fissure. He unlocks the door. She goes in ahead of him and stops, 
looking around the I sweet boxy to little living room. These together, What's up with what the folding I'll do chairs? Is the same as I did nothing. with uh, Mama just, Murphy's coat nothing. the other night. He goes to the two in the living room and claps them I'll shut. Get everything he sort goes of into done, the bedroom and, and comes back with two more. Over an he leans them against the wall beside the TV. You know, closer I to have to take those shade. back to the business center. Been meaning to. Want a soft or drink? There's a plenty in the mini bar. No, Which is, thank of course, you. Like said, if him sepia. Is it Coughlin? Did he let something slip? I didn't talk to Just him. Just Vallejo colors because the they're not frown. as shiny as... I specifically Citadel asked you to re-interview him, Ella. Then the frown lightens. Was it Becky, the girlfriend? So or the daughter? Shiny Did she... Listen, Frank. There's no easy way to say this. You have to step away from the case. That's for starters. He's giving her a quizzical little smile. He has no idea what she's talking about. Then it's time for you to retire. You've got your 20 years, 20 and more. I don't. And get some professional help. The little smile is still there. You're talking nonsense, Ella. I'm not going to retire. Not even thinking about it. What I'm going to do, what we're going to do, is collar Danny Coughlin and put him behind bars for the rest of his life. She's surprised by fury, but later she'll think it was there all along. What you're doing yeah, is risking exactly. any chance we have of making a case against him. You outed him to Plain's truth, Frank. The smile is fading. What gave you that crazy idea? You know, that Ronnie Shaw one. It's not uh, crazy. The army fatigue it's a fact. Put, put up on, you uh, outed him, Discord, and you outed back. yourself with your counting thing. At the end of the message you left, you said 15. It had nothing to do with anything, paint except when you add the number of choices on the menu together. One to five, you get 15. Now the smile is gone. On the basis of one number, you jump to the conclusion that sometimes a random number pops out of your mouth. Half the time you don't even know you're doing it. That's what happened on the recording Peter Anderson played for me. I heard it. You can hear it too if you want to. I've got it on my phone. His lips part in a grin, showing those eroded teeth. He grinds them, she thinks. Of course he does. I wouldn't want to report you for these false accusations, Ella. You've been a good partner. Couldn't ask for a better one. But if you persist, I'll have to. There's no way you could have recognized the voice that made that call that anybody could recognize it, because it was disguised by some gadget. Yes, it was, but how do you know that? He blinks, and there's the briefest of hesitations. Then he says, because I asked him. Anderson, I interviewed him. Not at any time when I was with you? No, from here, on the phone. Will he confirm that? I'm confirming it to you right now. Nevertheless, I'll ask him. If I have to. And we both know what he'll say, don't we? Jalbert doesn't reply. you got to remember, D, as if that, that I had to... And probably right now, that's just how paint a box of marines in the, ship, the in the store. Do you count those? Or maybe set them up and I've count the been steps out between fast. them? I think you better leave. And because I see your lips moving sometimes now, when you're counting. A lot of There's even there. a name for it. It's Arithmomania. Get out. Think about what you're saying, and we'll talk when you're not, not all wound up. Davis is suddenly too tired to stand. Who knew how exhausting confrontations of this sort could be? She sits and puts her open purse on the little desk. Her phone is inside, recording. You also planted drugs in Coughlin's truck at the high school. He recoils as if she had struck at him with her fist. That's an outrageous accusation. It was outrageous that you did it. Coughlin got suspicious when the kid who works with him saw you park in back instead of in the faculty lot. Coughlin you know, searched his truck, found the dope, and turned it over to me. What? I actually enjoyed when? the process of the painting. I met him at a coffee shop in Great Bend after the right. meeting where he challenged us to arrest yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. Which we could I not do then that, mate. and can't now, as I'm sure you found out in Wichita. He's a liar. And you went behind my back. Thanks, partner. She flushes. She can't help it. Jalbert is running his hands through his thick mat of receding hair. 
If there if were drugs painting, in his truck, you know, he planted them himself. He's sly. Oh boy, is he ever. And well, you actually if I believed his story. The marks like I want to Jalbert shakes yeah, okay. his head. His tone is pitying. But what she sees in his eyes is bare, unvarnished fury. Be careful of this man, she thinks. Danny was right about that. I had no idea you were so credulous, Ella. Has he convinced you of his dream story, too? Are you on his side now? I've spoken to Trooper Calton. That stops him. Coughlin saw his name tag. I called Calton and told him I knew who set up the plant and the search. I said I'd keep his participation quiet if he told me what his role was. He did. Jalbert goes to the window, looks out, then comes back to her. I didn't want him for the dope. I wanted him for Miss Yvonne. I wanted him locked up so I could turn the screws. Where's the dope now? Shit. In a safe place. That last question is a tiny bit frightening. She doesn't really believe Frank would hurt her, but he's not right. There's no question of that. He goes to the window again and comes back again. His lips are moving. He's counting. Does he even know he's doing it? She doesn't think so. He killed her. Raped her and killed her, Coughlin. You know he did. She thinks of Coughlin asking her about her cross. Did she wear it just for show, or was she a believer? Then he asked her if she could believe in God, but not his dream. Frank, listen carefully. In this context, it no longer matters whether he killed her or not. Here in this room, all that matters is you telling me you're going to write an email to Don Tishman saying you need to take a leave of absence for personal reasons, and you're planning to retire. Never. He's clenching and unclenching his fists. Either that or I go to Tishman and tell him what you've done. The call to Anderson might not get you fired, but the dope thing certainly will. More, it will muddy up any case we might be able to make against Danny Coughlin so completely that even that small well, really town need lawyer ball could get him off. On the regular, at least, you do that. So that I can get you did it. And then you have to send Christ me that, them silly fucking You screwed things. the case. You screwed like, yourself and you screwed me as well. Stuff. Look at the mess Except you made. Me because I'm going we can't let him get away, Jalbert says. He's looking but, around you know, the room, eyes not settling anywhere. Roundabouts. He did it. If you believe that, don't that's fuck up any chance we have of nailing him. I'm leaving now. It's a big decision, I know. Sleep on it. Sleep, he says and laughs. Sleep! I'll call you tomorrow morning. See how you feel. But the choice is pretty clear, it seems to me. Step down, and we still have a chance of making a case against Coughlin. There'll be no nasty mess about planted evidence, and you get to keep your pension. Do you think I care about my pension? He shouts. Cords stand out on his neck. Ella keeps her eyes locked on his. She's afraid to take them away. You might not care about it now, in the heat of the moment, oh, but yeah. you will later. And I know you still care about Yvonne Wicker. Think yeah, carefully, Yeah, it is Frank. a bit of a minefield, I'll but... let this slide if you step away. <sighs> I don't know. But it all hand, comes I'd out like if you don't. Some money off it. And on the other hand, I don't really stench. care, because it's not she what She walks to the it. door. It's one of the longest walks of her life, because she keeps expecting him to come yeah, after her. He doesn't. I do this in the hallway, because I live with on the door own. closed. She lets and out a breath she didn't know she was holding. It's kind she of starts to zip her purse close when from behind her comes a crash. And Something it's a comfortable level of socialness because does she want to know why? She when doesn't. I get a little bit burnt out with the Ella social walks side of it, I can just turn everybody off. In her car, she lowers her head and cries. I know offense to anyone that is watching there. and listening, especially just a moment. You know, People I when she really thought he might consider to be my friends like you there, Mr. Wolfenstein. 52. Franklin Jalbert has stayed in hundreds of motel rooms during his career as an investigator, crisscrossing Kansas from north to south and east to west. Almost all of those rooms come with plastic glasses in little baggies, mostly printed with slogans like, Sanitized for your safety. The glasses on top of the minibar of his little suite in the 
celebration center just happened to be real glass. He registers the weight of the one he's picked up before it's too late to stop, and he probably wouldn't have stopped anyway. He hurls it against the door Davis has just left, and it shatters. Better the glass than her, he thinks. Not that I would ever hurt her. Of course not. She may be a traitor, but they put in some good time together. Caught some bad boys and bad girls. He taught Ella, and she was eager to learn. Only she hasn't learned enough, it seems. She doesn't understand how dangerous Coughlin is. He wonders if perhaps after their that, yeah, traitorous be meeting at the coffee shop, they might have gone somewhere nicely, else. I've got the wash on it. Maybe to a motel? No, no. She'd never. Not with the prime Aren't suspect be okay? in a murder case. He says, you know, never touch wood. Really? Never? Coughlin's not a bad-looking man, and he has a wide-eyed, I'm-telling-the-truth look about him. Some might find that appealing. Is it really beyond the realm of possibility that she and he may be kind of a weird twist on the Stockholm Central? In spite of her backstabbing, he can't believe it of her. And never mind, Ella. She's out of the picture. The question is what he's going to do about Coughlin. The answer seems to be nothing. She's put him in a box. That damned spineless trooper had to spill his guts, didn't he? The idea of retiring, as she suggested, is awful. Like being marched toward the edge of a cliff. He can't imagine stepping off into the void. He has no hobbies, except for the daily newspaper crossword and the occasional jigsaw puzzle. His vacations have consisted of aimless wanderings in a rented camper, seeing sights he doesn't care about and snapping pictures he rarely looks at later. Each hour feels three hours long. Retirement would multiply those long hours by a thousand, a then two thousand, then scary. ten thousand. Each brush. hour haunted by thoughts of Danny Coughlin looking at him across the table with and that wide-eyed, wouldn't-hurt-a-fly gaze, the, saying, the, Arrest me! You can't, can you? Thoughts of Danny Coughlin stopping in some other state for another young girl with her thumb out and a pack on her back. It's a little bit. And what can I do? Well, he can do one thing. Pick up the broken glass. He brings over a wastebasket, kneels down, and starts doing that. Pretty soon, he's up to 57 shards. Hello, well, she has it going, mate. 1,653 when added in progression. I wouldn't have hurt her. Absolutely not. But there was one second. Sharp pain needles the ball of his thumb. A bead of blood so appears. Work you put in the, uh, Jalbert realizes he's earlier. lost count. He debates Thanks starting sharing, again man. from one. 53. Annie Coughlin's last week in Manitou, Kansas, is both sad and a relief. On Tuesday, he finds a big pile of dog shit in his mailbox. He dons a pair of his rubber work gloves, removes it, and washes the inner surface clean. Someone will want to use that mailbox after he's gone. On Wednesday, he goes to Food Town to pick up a few final supplies, including a steak he plans to eat on Friday night as a goodbye dinner. He's not in the market for long. Right. But when he comes out, the two back. I said, thanks for putting them pictures in the uh, Discord earlier. Very nice work, mate. Really liked it. Very much enjoyed them. Tires of his truck are flat. At least they're not punctured, he thinks. But probably just because whoever did it wasn't carrying a knife. He calls Jesse because Jesse's number How's is the volume now? Am I louder than the uh, audio book? Jesse says his dad left a lot of stuff when he ran out I on his family, that and one of those thing. things was a Hospel tire inflator. Give me 20 minutes, he says. Right. While Danny waits, he stands beside his truck and collects dirty looks. Jesse arrives in his beat-up caprice, and the Tundra's back tires are good to go in no time. Danny thanks him, alarmed to feel tears threatening. No problem, Jesse says and holds out his hand. Listen, no, mate, I appreciate people putting stuff in the Discord. 
You know, no, you didn't kill that girl. Quite often, it's... Thanks for that, too. Only a couple of How's us. How's I was but, uh, by and saw you hauling lumber. Remember that my night. Discord exists. And Jesse to be quite Shirley. honest, a lot of the time, I'm him. not even one of them. What's up with you, Danny? What's next? Getting out of town this weekend. So a lot of my work I ends up on Chris Rose's Discord, with. Charlie's Discord, or some gear Instagram. And, and a place. Jesse sighs. Probably for the best, the way things are. Shoot me a text when you get someplace. I think it says something when you shy look, it's all forget 17. that your own Discord exists. You know, stay in touch. I'll do that, Danny says. Don't cut off any fingers at that mill. Jesse flashes a grin. Got the same advice from my mom's. She says I'm the man of the house now. On Thursday, most of his stuff packed and ready to go. The trailer looking nude somehow. He gets a call from Edgar Ball while he's drinking his first cup of coffee. Ball says, I have bad news, good news, and really good news. At least I think it is. Which do you want Let's first? Have a Danny sets quick his look cup at down the with a bag. While we're here. So there's my uh, CX404 that I painted yesterday. I tried to get the glowing effects on the rad roach here, but I didn't want it too much because he's dead. But I think it came out all right. And I'm happy with the way the fur turned out anyway. There you go. You can see a little bit of the green there on the carapace of the rad roach. So that's that one. And this one is uh, Ronnie Shaw from the Minutemen that you find at the castle location. And I think she took about 45 minutes, not including drying time. Very happy with how this came out, considering how quick it was. Very happy indeed. There we go. And if it all do it. Yeah, I like this on here, mate. I do like this. Uh, is it a cloak or whatever he's got over his head? I like that a lot. And of course, we've got Wolfenstone's orc that he started for his KFC entry on Kev's uh, channel. And if you ask him nicely, I'm sure he'll tell you what he did to get that lovely skin gradient going. All very nice. Very nice indeed. You want to go think. out to Dabney's to celebrate? Lovely, lovely Big work from everybody. Combined. Dabney's is two towns over and should be safe enough, especially if the sneaky people Archie. in the newspapers are running it from the Archie. days Everyone when Danny wanted to look like Archie. Lonesome Dave Pebble. I mean, if I'm 100% honest, I take a sniper Sounds rifle good. and basically become bring a, a sneaky Archie when I'm playing Fallout. I used to work with. But Jesse says he can't as much as he'd like to. He punches in at eight. Also, my mom was pretty mad that I went out to help you yesterday. I told her you didn't do what they were saying, and she said that didn't matter because I was a young black man. Oh. You were, you know, right. a white Next man color, I think we're going to move into anything. some I get brands. It. Well, yeah. Starting with... But I'd go anyway if I didn't have to work. Of all things, I appreciate that, flesh. Jesse, but your mom is probably right. He goes out to Dabney's. Ball is there. They order huge breakfasts and eat every bite. Danny offers to split the check, but Ball won't hear of it. He asks Danny what comes next for him. Danny I'll tells him about his plan to go to Colorado to be near his brother, who's on the spectrum, but has a gift to psychologists to examine him in his late uh, teens called sort of Global Recognition. Basically, he sees where everything is. You save this gloom and flesh talk for things about like that boots and odd bits of webbing. You got something in mind, Ball says as they leave the restaurant. I've been thinking about it ever since our first go round with that hairball Jalbert. Because, well, it's and a then nice I got brand. reading the it's comments and the eagle and the telescope and i thought i yeah, feel for something like these long duster type coats i have no idea what you're talking about what comments i guess you don't read them it's the equivalent of letters to the editor in the old days after you finish reading the long story camera. you can All comment right. on it there are lots of comments on the there story you about you 
better camera. Hanging fast and hanging. Got to move flesh. Danny said. Too pink for the coat. And I will like use that, a darker sure, brand for this long coat on her. Actually, did dream and where the body was. This one has got a long coat. Everyone, as well. those that believe you, I mean, has a story about how their grandma knew the propane was going to explode and got everyone out of the house, or that the plane was going to crash, so they took a later flight. Those are premonitory dreams, Danny says. He's done some reading. Not the same. Yes, but there are also comments from people who dream the location of a lost ring, or a lost dog, or in one case, a missing kid. This woman claims she dreamed a neighbor boy fell down an old well, and there he was. It's not just you, Danny. And people love stuff like that because it gives them the idea that there's more to the world than we know. He pauses. Of course, there are also people who think you're so full of shit you squeak. That makes Danny laugh. At Danny's truck, Ball says, Okay, so here's what I'm thinking. It might be a way to get a little money, but that's really secondary. It would be a way to fight back. You're thinking, what? Filing a lawsuit. Exactly. For harassment. Someone hucked a brick at your trailer, right? Right. Dog shit in your mailbox? Let the air out of your tires? Pretty thin. Danny says, and I thought cops were protected from that sort of thing. Jalbert may retire, but he was a cop in good standing when he came after me. Ah, but he planted drugs on you, Ball says, and if we can get the cop who rousted you in court and under oath, can we go back to your trailer and talk about it? I mean, what else have you got to do? Not much, Danny admits. Sure, I guess we could talk about it. He drives back to Oak Grove with Ball behind him on his Honda. Danny pulls up at his trailer and sees someone sitting on the concrete block steps, head down, hands dangling between his knees. Danny gets out of his truck, closes the door, and for a moment just stands there, struck by deja vu, almost overwhelmed by it. His visitor is wearing a high school letter jacket. Where has he seen that? Ball's Honda Goldwing pulls up behind his truck. The kid stands up and raises his head. Then Danny knows. It's the kid from the newspaper photo. The one standing in front of the hearse and behind his grief-stricken parents. Bastard, you killed my sis, the kid says. He reaches into the right pocket of his letter jacket and brings out a revolver. Behind Danny, the Goldwing shuts off and Ball dismounts. But that's in another universe. Whoa, son, I didn't... That's as far as he gets before the kid fires. A fist hits Danny in the midsection. He takes a step back and then the pain comes, like the worst acid indigestion attack he ever had. The pain goes up to his throat and down to his thighs. He gropes behind him for the door handle of his tundra and can barely feel it when he finds it. His legs are getting loopy. He tells him not to buckle. Warmth is running down his stomach. His shirt and jeans are turning red. Hey! Ball shouts from that other universe. Hey! Gun! No shit, Danny thinks. With his weight to pull it, the driver's door of the tundra swings open. Danny doesn't fall where he stands only because he opened his window on the way back from Dabney's. The morning air was so cool and fresh. That seems like another lifetime. He hooks his elbow through the window and around the doorpost and pivots like a stripper on a pole. The kid fires again and there's a plung sound as the bullet hits the door below the open window. Gun! Gun! Edgar Ball is shouting. The next bullet goes through the open window and buzzes past Danny's right ear. He sees the kid's cheeks are wet with tears. He sees Althea Dumfries standing on the top of her trailer. Fanciest one in the park, Danny thinks. Crazy what goes through your head when you're shot. She appears to be holding a piece of toast with a bite out of it. Danny goes to his knees. The pain in his abdomen is excruciating. He hears another plung as another bullet strikes the tundra's open door. Then he's all the way down. He can see the kid's feet. He's wearing Converse sneakers. 
Danny sees the gun when the kid and that my little fluffy ground. babies. Ball is still He's yelling. Using a wet palette today. Ball is bawling. He in case thinks. we forgets a bit. And then the world slides into darkness. Let's see if we 54. Get this yellow used. He comes to on a stretcher. Edgar Ball is looking down at him, eyes wide. There's dirt smeared on his cheeks and forehead. He's saying something. It might be, hang in there, buddy. And then the stretcher bumps something and the pain explodes. The pain becomes the world. And then he tries to scream and can only moan. Very for similar a moment, palettes, there's the sky for and a roof above him. All four and he thinks is, is, it might be an ambulance. they're not an I army in so the regular scheme of things. Was I out? Hello, Kevy Coles. Someone says, a little pinch, and then they you'll feel are. better. There's a pinch. Kind of the same faction, so Darkness I'm trying to get spells. a matching colour scheme. 55. When it goes away, he sees lights sliding by above him. It's like a shot in a movie. A loudspeaker calls for Dr. And Broder. And seeing as it's both warm feet Dr. and... Dr. Broder, stat, Kevy it calls says. here. Did you notice that I Danny linked you into to that speak. green stuff world tries to say... Is it the good doctor? The one on TV? Just as a joke. He knows better. But all that comes out are a few um, muffled the, sounds the, because he's got some kind of a mask over his mouth and nose. Doors bang open. There are brighter lights and green tile walls. He supposes it's an operating room and he wants to say he doesn't know if he can afford an operation because he lost his job. So you've been out today then, Kevin. Hands hoist him. Anything interesting? Oh, Jesus, anything nice? Savior, it hurts. There's a pinch. Darkness follows. Cool. Don't 56. forget you are a moderator, so you can use the shout out. Now he's in a bed. To. Has to be a hospital bed. I mean, I think there's only there's me, light, you. But not the cruel, we're going to well cut you open light shining down. You might as well use room. it while you've got the opportunity, in it. No, this is daylight. Margie, his ex, is sitting by his bed. She's all dolled up, and Danny knows that if she dressed up for him, he's probably going to die. His midsection is stiff. Stiff as a plank. Bandages, maybe. And there's an IV hanging on a hook, and he thinks, if they're putting stuff into me, maybe I'm not going to die. Margie asks, how do you feel, Dano? Like in I've even put a command on. Got along. Can't remember like, the, the, you can't remember this. Dano. And he tries to answer, but can't. Darkness. Can't remember that. That. 57. Can't remember. He opens that. his eyes. Well, that. And Edgar Ball is sitting by his bed. No dirt on his face, so he must have cleaned up. How much time has passed? Danny has no idea. That's the book we're listening to tonight. Close call, but you're going to pull through, Ball tells him. And Danny thinks, that's what they all say. On the other hand, maybe it's the truth. Good thing you got behind the truck door. If he'd been shooting a larger caliber gun, the bullets would have gone right through, but it was a thirty-two. Kid, he manages. Albert Wicker. Just want me to do it for you, you Ivan lazy Wicker's bastard. brother. I knew that, Danny tries to say. So, fired three or four times. Since it's my stream and not Drop yours, you can get your own back and take right this out of me if you like. I'll Went let you. Went out to the street and sat down on the curb and waited for the cops. In a movie, I would have tackled him. But the truth is, I face-planted beside my motorcycle at the first gunshot. Sorry. I'm just glad you weren't here okay. when I was painting on the wrong Danny fucking said, camera. You okay? Thanks for saying that. We've got a real suit now, Danny. Soon as you get better. Danny tries to smile. He closes his eyes. Darkness. Kid started right. Fifty-eight. <laughs> yeah, proper Is pro. It Jesse next time <laughs> or a dream? They're giving him a lot of dope, so, so he can't you can call be me sure. a pro, mate. Kev taught but me all he knows. Positive, almost positive, that he sees a dark brown hand over his white one. Fifty-nine. Next time he surfaces, it's Ella Davis. He's a little stronger, and she looks a little younger and 
faded jeans and a boat neck tee. Her hair is down, and she is smiling. Danny, are you awake? Yes, a bear croak. Water, is there... She holds a glass oh, for him. For fuck's sake. There's Bloody a bendy God. straw sticking out of it. He drinks, and it's heaven on his throat. Danny, we got him. The kid? His voice is a little stronger. I think Edgar told the cops, not the kid. Him. The man who killed Yvonne Wicker. He... Are you getting this? Do you understand what I'm telling you? Yes. Does he feel relieved? You can paint black better when you've had a beer. That's He weird, can't mate. tell. He's not even sure how badly he's hurt or if he'll ever be really well again. What if he has to spend the rest of his life shitting into a bag? He's confessed, Danny. Confessed to Wicker and two others. Cops in Illinois and Missouri are looking for the bodies. All right, Danny says. He's very tired. He wants her to go. I went to Mass and prayed for you. It helps if you believe, Danny says. He feels her take his hand, her skin cool on his. He thinks he should tell her he doesn't blame her. But the very idea of blame seems pointless right now. He turns his head, floats away. Darkness. Sixty. By the third day, possibly. He hurts bad, I, I think that's where a lot of people world. go wrong when the paint is there. Uh, he's at regional hospital. Things like white bed. armor. And he's going to be they here get their head. Week, they get sort of too inside days. their own head and overthink it way too much. Stomach. He's been repaired and sewed up. But Broder, the doctor in charge of his case, says if he tries to walk, you know what it's like when you overthink all this. to open it up again. Okay, fair enough. grateful it wasn't a soft-nosed slug and a bigger caliber. That would have done a lot of damage. You'll be on soft food for a while. I hope you like scrambled eggs and yogurt. Being in bed means the bedpan, but the indignity of that is mitigated by the fact that he's been spared the catheter and colostomy bag. He learns that Margie was allowed to see him early on because she claimed to be his wife, which wasn't true. Edgar Ball was allowed to see him because he claimed to be his lawyer, which was. Ella Davis was also allowed in because she was a KBI officer and because she said she had good news to share. Very good. And Jesse? That might have been a drug-induced hallucination. Yeah. Danny doesn't believe it. He thinks Jesse Shit. slipped in somehow and took his hand. Brush At some point, you'll have to ask him. Stevie doesn't know, and that's good. It would upset him. Danny will have to tell him at some point, but that's for later. Let's get some bony bone Late in the afternoon bone. of his fourth day at the hospital, he's allowed that to sit bone? by the no, window in his room. Two okay. steps, supported by a pair of orderlies. While he's well. enjoying Jesus the feel Christ, of the sun cold. on his face, Edgar Ball comes to see him again. He sits on the bed Just and the asks Danny how he feels. Not bad. The dope is primo. What do you want to know? Everything. That will strain my powers of condensation. They're only giving me 20 minutes. Then they have to put you back to bed and irrigate you. Ball grimaces. I don't even want to know what that entails. Davis told me they caught the guy who killed Yvonne Wicker, but I passed out before she could give me any details. Start there. His name? is Andrew Iverson, no fixed address, an itinerant Mr. Fix-It. He was heading west, driving a little blue panel truck with Andy I, plumbing and heating on the side. It showed up on a video both in Arkansas City, where Wicker last stayed, and at the Gas and Go, where she was last spotted. He's also on video in Great Bend, Manitou, and Cawker City. Cawker's close to Dart County, isn't it? Yes. Wicker was probably dead in the back of his truck when he drove through there. He was looking for a lonely spot to bury her. And found one. Iverson's picture should be in the encyclopedia next to the entry for serial killers. He drives, stops for a while, does some business, 
Cash only, he told the cops, because he says cash don't tell. You got this from Davis? Yes. We had a long talk. She feels terrible about this whole business. She's not the only one, Danny thinks. Iverson killed a girl in Illinois and another in Missouri. Buried them in rural locations. The cops have found one. We'll do They're still his looking for the other. In the bone as well. He so picked up a fourth girl it. hitchhiking in Wyoming, outside a little town called Glen Rock. He pulled over on some country road and tried to rape her. She had a knife in her boot. While he was getting his pants down, she stabbed him four times. Good for her, Danny says. He thinks of the dog that was chewing on Yvonne Wicker's arm. Goddamn good for her. Davis says this was one tough check. She tumbled him out of the van, drove toward Casper until she had a cell signal, and called the police. He wasn't where the girl said he was, but they followed a blood trail to a nearby barn. He was in a horse stall, passed out from blood loss. Davis says he's going to recover. He confessed? She told me he confessed, unless I dreamed that part. You didn't. Wounds hurt, as I think you know. You got shot once. Iverson got stabbed four times. Once in the cheek, once in the shoulder, once in the side, and once in the leg. He wanted painkillers. The go. cops wanted information. They both I think that got bone what they looks wanted. all right. Davis told you all that? She did, and asked me to tell you. And I think she's afraid to face you again. I get that. But I she guess in the end she did her hand. job. And she stood up to Jalbert, if that's what you mean, think. but that's a story for another day. My 20 minutes are almost up. Do you remember the charm bracelet baby. the Wicker Girl was wearing? Danny remembers. Groovy baby. He saw it twice, once in his dream and once in real life. Iverson had two of the charms in his kill sack as trophies. There was more stuff in there from the other two. Where's the kid that shot me? Albert Wicker is in a Manitou motel with his folks. He made bail, or rather his parents did. I know the lawyer who represented him at his arraignment. He says the Wickers mortgaged their house to come up with the money. Danny thinks about that. Daughter dead, son facing attempted murder charges. Parents probably facing bankruptcy. And I'm in the hospital with a hole in my stomach, Danny thinks. The wandering plumber did a lot of damage, and that's just the spreading circle of pain around the young woman Jalbert insisted on calling poor Miss Yvonne. Danny wishes the girl who got away, the fabled last girl, had stabbed Iverson in the balls for good measure. I don't want to press charges, Danny says. Edgar Ball smiles. Am I surprised? I am not. But it's not entirely up to you. Wicker will do some time, but considering the mitigating circumstances, it may not be much. A nurse pokes her head in the door. Sir, you need to let my good pal Danny rest. Plus, he oh, needs yeah, some services right, you I won't think. want to be around for. Irrigation, Danny says glumly. This doesn't happen when someone gets shot on TV. Five more minutes, Ball says, please. You can have three the nurse says, and leaves. I had a meeting with Don Tishman, who was technically in charge of the KBI investigation. I laid out the facts of the matter concerning Jalbert, but felt it would be smart to withhold the name of the trooper who stopped you and looked for drugs. For a small-town lawyer who specializes in real estate contracts, you've been pretty busy. Danny means it lightly, almost as a joke but Ball flushes and looks down at his hands. I should have tackled that kid. I could have. He was totally focused on you. Instead, I went face down in the dirt. Danny repeats that it's not like TV. Ball raises his head. Understood, but I don't have to like it. No man wants to think he's a coward, especially one that rides a badass bike. I wouldn't call a Honda Goldwing badass, Edgar. A Harley soft tail, that's badass. Be that as it may, we've reached an accommodation, I think. A few details still to be worked out, but yes, it looks good. 
in exchange for keeping quiet about Jalbert, who has indeed put in his retirement papers. You're going to have your medical bills paid by the Sunflower State and with a certain sum left over. Not huge, but tidy. Five figures. It will get you relocated in Colorado if you still decide to go. The nurse doesn't just poke her head in this time. She points at Ball. Not asking, telling. Going, Ball says, and gets up. You could have your job back, you know, once you're well enough to do it. Good to know, Danny says. Now it's time he for has the no levers. intention of staying. Someone threw a brick at his trailer. Someone put shit in his mailbox. And I don't know if I've mentioned Bill it Dumfries before. Bill basically but told him on behalf of the good people of Oak Grove to get out of Dodge. What weighs against those things is Darla Jean. This in the dirt is the Vallejo Copper Brown, and I think it is absolutely cheeks. perfect for but aged leather. He doesn't think it weighs enough to tip the scales. He has a brother in Colorado, and if getting shot does nothing else, it gives you insight into how short the time in fact, is. In fact, I think it's slightly... A gold wing is not badass. No, a gold wing is not badass. A gold wing is an old man fight. didn't even help catch the guy. But think of the adventure. And to be quite honest, the other one he had. mentioned, the Harley Softail, is not Danny badass either. It's a Harley Softail. On that note, Ball says, and takes his leave. All right, start with these two long coats. 61. While Albert Wicker is spending his first afternoon in the Wilder County Jail, hardly aware of what he did, the last few days are a blur, that morning hardly there at all. Franklin Jalbert is sitting in his dining room, in his back girl's room, bike. <laughs> doing a thousand-piece jigsaw yeah, girl's puzzle. Bike. When completed, it will show a collage of movie posters. Classics like Casablanca, Tell me again, Dave, what do you write? It's a Wonderful Life, <laughs> Jaws, two dozen in all. Jalbert keeps track of how many pieces Or is that not the in. point? After ten pieces, he takes one step in place, as if marching so he can sit down again. After twenty, he takes two, one out from his chair and one back. He's up to eight hundred pieces, almost done. The tiger, you ring. ride the tiger, get he looks it. looks at the screen and sees H. Allard. Hank Allard is a friend of his, a captain in the Kansas Highway Patrol. Jalbert is torn between answering and doing the next set of steps, which would be one to eighty inclusive. He decides on the steps. 3,240. Quite a lot. He starts at 80 and counts in reverse. The steps take him outside to the small backyard of his ranchette and back again. He sees that previous trips have made a path in the grass, a rut, in fact. He's aware that the step counting thing, and running the chairs, that too, has gotten even more out of control since his failure to arrest Danny Coughlin. Davis called it Arithmomania. While doing the steps associated with his jigsaw puzzle, Jalbert often thinks he's like a hamster running on a wheel, going and going, shitting on the run and never getting anywhere. But that's all right. What Davis couldn't realize is that this minor craziness keeps him from the greater craziness of contemplating a future from which his job has been subtracted. How many jigsaw puzzles can he do before facing the pointlessness of his life going forward and slides his service weapon deep into his mouth? Boom. Gone. God knows he wouldn't be the first. God knows he's thought about it. Is thinking. He comes back to the steps when he's down to five. By the time he gets to zero, he's in the kitchen. Time for another ten pieces, and then he'll count down from eighty-one. Possibly first by odd numbers. Honestly, I think they could rename this ones. story All Coppers Are Bastards. After that, it will be time for lunch and a nap. He loves his naps. Such smooth oblivion. His phone is beside the mostly completed jigsaw puzzle. He's currently assembling the Ten Commandments, which he most definitely doesn't consider a classic. Hank Allard has left a voicemail, and he sounds excited. Call me. I've got news. You'll want to hear. Jalbert can't imagine any news he wants to hear, get you, but he returns viewers. the call. We do not talk to the police Allard answers on the first ring and wastes no time. If we are reporting Your boy a crime, Coughlin has been shot, 
What? We give the nice Galbert policeman stands up giving the table a hard bump and sliding nearly completed puzzles details. to the edge. And Several then, pieces what do we do? The floor. That's right. We Alan shut laughs. the fuck up. The wicker girl's brother shot the motherfucker. You want to talk about justice? Whoop, there it is. Is he dead? We can hope. The first trooper to respond to the scene said there was a lot of blood and several bullet holes in the bastard's truck. They took him to regional in an ambulance instead of treating him at that little excuse for a hospital in Manitou, so it was bad. Maybe he died on the way. Jalbert shakes a fist at the ceiling, thinking, Closure! Sweet closure! God did what it I It is could. kind of bleak as well, mate, but I like His bleak voice stories. Isn't quite steady. I wouldn't disagree, Allard says. Keep me informed. You know I'm out of the loop. Which is one more fucked up thing in a fucked up world, Allard says. You bet I will. That night, Jalbert goes out to Bullwinkle's and gets drunk for the first time in 20 years. He does not count steps, which is a relief. Counting steps and running chairs is hard work. So many numbers to keep track of. So easy to lose count. He supposes nobody would believe that, but it's the truth. If you lose count, you have to start over. While Jalbert is drinking his second whiskey and soda, Allard calls again. Jalbert has to shout because of the combined roar of the TV, the jukebox, and a bunch of unwinding KU summer students. Is he dead? No. Serious condition. Shot in the stomach. Jalbert first feels disappointed. Then happy. Isn't that better than life in prison, where Coughlin would get three meals a day, a TV in his cell, and time in the exercise yard? It hurts to get shot in the gut. The pain oh, yeah, is excruciating. Quite nicely there, Dave. So Jared has heard. And it's the sort of wound that Coughlin might not, depending on the caliber of the slug, ever come back from. Maybe that's good, he shouts. I get where you're coming from, buddy, Allard says. And from the sound of it, I get where you are. Have one for me. I'll have two, Jalbert says and laughs. It's the first real laugh to come out of him in a long time. And the hangover he wakes up with the next day feels entirely justified. He takes a long walk without counting his steps, simply hoping, almost praying, that Coughlin will live, but get some sort of serious infection, possibly need to have his stomach removed. Was it possible to live if that happened? Would you have to be fed through a tube? If so, wouldn't that be an even greater punishment? Jalbert thinks yes. By noon, his hangover is gone. He eats a hearty lunch and doesn't even think about going into the dining room to work on his classic movie posters puzzle. He is contemplating the idea of sending Coughlin flowers with a card reading, Don't get well soon. When his phone rings, it's his ex-partner. Frank, I have some fantastic news. I already know. Our boy Coughlin took one in the belly. He's in the hospital. They caught him. Jalbert shakes his head, not sure he's following her. Do you mean Yvonne Wicker's brother, or did you uncover some evidence about Coughlin? Did you? Is that it? He could hope. Gut shot and going to prison. How beautiful that would be. The man who killed her. They caught him in Iowa. His name is Andrew Iverson. Jalbert frowns. His headache is creeping back. I have no idea what you're talking about. Coughlin killed poor Miss. Iverson was trying to take another one. She stabbed him and got away. Davis pours out the whole story, saving the best for last. Two of the charms from Yvonne Wicker's bracelet in Iverson's kill bag. We hounded an innocent man for nothing, she finishes, because we couldn't believe. Jalbert sits up straight. His headache is worse than ever. He will have to do something about it. Take some aspirin, then run the chairs. We didn't hound him, Ella. We pursued him. Given what we knew, we had every right, every duty. Stop with the we stuff, Frank. Now she just sounds weary. I didn't give his name to that free newspaper, and I didn't plant dope in his truck. 
You did those things on your own, and I didn't get him shot. You're not thinking clearly. That's you, not me. I told him I went to Mass and prayed for him, and do you know what he said? It helps if you believe. I'm going to keep that in mind going forward. Then you better quit police work and get a job as a, a voodoo priestess or something. Do you not feel the slightest shred of guilt, Frank? No. I'm going to hang up now, Ella. Don't call me again. He ends the call. He runs the chairs. He puts ten pieces in his jigsaw puzzle and then counts steps in his backyard. This cop is fucking nuts, down to mate. one. A total of 3,321. A good number, but his head still aches. 62. Danny's supper following Edgar Ball's visit is green gluck that looks like liquefied snot and tastes a little like V8. If that is, V8 tasted nasty. He gets it all down anyway, because for the first time since waking up in the hospital, he's actually hungry. In truth, for the first time since his trip to Gunnell in Dart County, things have changed. He feels saved. At nine o'clock, a nurse comes in with a couple of pain pills. He tells her he doesn't need them, at least not yet. She raises her eyebrows. Really? Will you be able to sleep? I think so. Leave them on the night table in case I want them later. She does that. Checks his bandages for seepage, finds none, and wishes him oh, a good yeah. night. Full on. Danny wishes her the same. His stomach hurts, but the pain is down to a dull throb unless he makes a sudden move. He grabs the TV controller, switches around through a few channels, then turns it off. He thinks about Edgar Ball saying he could probably have his old job back if he wants it. The idea actually hurts. There are people in Manitou who are always going to believe he's guilty of something. Gossip is like radioactive waste. It has a long and toxic half-life. Stevie sent him an email with attachments to several rentals in Nederland and Longmont. They would have been far out of his reach a week ago, but if Edgar's right about how he, Danny, might get a little payday, he's still thinking about that when he drifts into the first good sleep he's had since the night before he dreamed that inexplicable dream. That lasts until 1.20 a.m., when the second dream begins. 63. Unless he's working a case, and thanks to Ella Davis, all of that is done, Jalbert goes to bed every night at 9.30. That's supposed to be the healthiest time, according to what he's read on the Internet. But tonight, he's not able to get down. Just tonight? If only. He hasn't managed yeah, more than done, a few done, done late doses He's since turn finding out a wandering plumber bed. named Andrew Iverson has been arrested for the murder of Yvonne Wicker and two others. Who is the bad guy in all of this? Frank Jalbert. And who is the loser in all of this? Frank Jalbert. Twenty good years. Half a dozen commendations. All flushed down the commode. Everything he dedicated his life to is gone. His name is Mud. While Danny is having a good sleep in Great Bend, Jalbert is wide awake in Lawrence. His mind has turned on itself, gnawing and biting like a mangy dog snapping at its own flanks until the blood flows. After ninety minutes or so of tossing and turning, he throws back the covers and gets up. He has to walk, and he has to count. If he doesn't, he'll go crazy. The thought of sticking his gun in his mouth comes, and it's attractive. But if he does that, will he not be giving Coughlin the ultimate victory? And Ella, Ella saying, we hounded an innocent man for nothing because we couldn't believe. That was nonsense, not to mention Monday morning quarterbacking. Were they supposed to throw out years of fact-based police work because a high school janitor said he'd had a dream? 
When COVID was burning across America, they said to follow the science. When you were a policeman, you followed the logic. Did that not make sense? Or had the world gone crazy? Ella believed he killed her, he says, as he leaves the house on this hot summer night. She believed it as much as I did. He walks on West 6th Street in his bedroom slippers, past the Walgreens and the High V, past Dillon's and Starbucks and the Big Biscuit, now closed and dark. He walks past the Six Mile Chop House and the Alvadora Apartments, where he once arrested a murderer who is now doing his time in El Dorado. He walks all the way to the Highway 40 interchange. He counts his steps. He's up to 154. A total of 11,935 when added sequentially. Then a sudden burst of insight, of logic, things going on these lights pages. up his mind. Did the girl in Wyoming escape Andrew Iverson? Andrew Iverson in his little plumbing and heating van? Yes, Jalbert accepts that. Did Andrew Iverson kill two other girls, one in Illinois and the other in Missouri? He accepts that, too. Did Andrew Iverson have two of the charms from poor Miss Yvonne's bracelet in his kill sack? All right. Say he did. And say Danny Coughlin put them there. It makes perfect sense once you throw out the New Age bullshit. Ella may believe that crap now, but Jalbert never did and never will. Follow the science. Follow the logic. Coughlin and Iverson knew each other. He's sure of it. It well, stands to reason. When you're Jalbert doing is also sure that the good a, police work necessary to uncover that connection thing. will never be done. Why would any KBI investigator even try yes, when everything is tied up in a neat bow? And then when Danny Coughlin will probably come out of this looking like a hero who just tried to do his civic duty. That fits the a psychic hero. She's kind of the opposite the of what this cop is doing. The question in Jalbert's mind as he stands looking at late-night cars passing on Highway 40 is whether Iverson held poor Miss Yvonne down while Coughlin raped her, or if Coughlin held her down while Iverson did his dirt. Would they be the first kill team? No, of course not. There have been others. Ian Brady and Myra Hindley, Kenneth Bianchi and Angelo Bono, Dick Hickok and Perry Smith, those two right here in Kansas. A car goes by on 6th, and a young voice sings out, Hey, Pop, you're in your pajamas. There's diminishing laughter. Jalbert doesn't notice. He's putting the pieces together, just as he put the pieces of his classic movie posters puzzled together, and they all fit. Iverson called Coughlin from wherever he picked up poor Miss Yvonne, somewhere near that gas-and-go down south, and asked, if he, Coughlin, wanted to have a little fun. And when they were done, Coughlin stripped a couple of charms from poor Miss Yvonne's charm bracelet and told Iverson, told him, Here, you take these, Jalbert mutters. Something to look at when you whack off. No bullshit about dreams, just cold logic. Coughlin thought, I'll not only get the fun of raping her, and killing her, I'll get the glory of being the one to find her. It makes perfect sense. Divine sense. Because Coughlin always knew they traced the source of that ridiculous anonymous call, didn't he? How could he not? It occurs to Jalbert, he's walking home now, counting forgotten, that he might be able to investigate on his own, do some digging, Find out where the lives of Coughlin and Iverson intersected. At school, maybe. After that, emails oh, and texts. Hey, you won't stay. Iverson killed others. It seems likely that Coughlin has as well. Likely. Try certain. But be real. He hasn't the resources to mount that kind of an investigation, and if he did, he'd draw attention to himself, and they, KBI, the newspapers, would shut him down. They have their story, complete with, gosh, wow, dream information. No one would believe his. Take your pension and shut up, they'd say. You're lucky we let you have one after what you did. Which left what? 
where was justice for poor Miss Yvonne? Who would be her advocate? That, too, seems perfectly clear to Jalbert. He will have to take care of Danny Coughlin himself. This very night. Tomorrow morning, the hospital where Coughlin is currently recuperating will fill with people. But in the small hours ahead, it will be at its lowest ebb. Coughlin isn't being guarded. Why would he be? And the blind idiots at KBI think poor Miss Yvonne's killer is handcuffed to his own hospital bed in Wyoming. Coughlin is the psychic hero. At home, Jalbert dresses in jeans and his black suit coat, the one he always wore when he was on the job. He puts his badge on his belt, technically against the law now that he's retired, but it will help him get in if any late shift person asks questions. To this he adds his service weapon. 64. Quarter of two in the morning, Charles Beeson, so, by the way, this the is the worrying thing about American cops. Is playing he's been Ninja forced to retire phone. because he's a fucking Chuck? lunatic. But they're letting him keep Chuck. his gun. He turns and is startled to see Danny Coughlin limping toward him. Danny's Johnny flaps around his knees. He's barefoot. One hand is pressed against his abdomen. Tears are running down his cheeks. They are tears of pain, but they are also tears of horror. Mr. Coughlin, you're not supposed to get out of bed until the doctor gives you permission. My phone, Danny says. He's hoarse, panting. It's in my drawer, but the battery's dead. Please, I have to charge it up. I have to make a call. Yeah. The pain wasn't bad when he fell asleep, but walking down the hall has awakened it. He grimaces and almost falls. Land of the fucking Chuck free, Chuck arm around him, but that's not good enough. He hoists Danny into his arms and carries him back to his room. Once he's in bed, Chuck holds out his own phone. Here, if it's important, use mine. Danny shakes his head. His hair is sticking to his forehead. Sweat runs down his cheeks. I need my contacts. I put her number in my contacts. Even two percent will be enough. I have to make that call. 65. While Danny's phone is on a charger in the nurse's station, Jalbert is on Route 56 heading for Great Bend. The interstate would be shorter, but he's less likely to run into the highway patrol on 56, and he's running hot. According to his GPS, the trip from Lawrence should take about three and a half hours if he kept to the speed limit, but with the highway almost completely deserted at this small hour, he's doing 85. It was almost 12.30 in the morning before he got rolling. He expects to be there by 3 a.m. at the latest. 150 minutes, which is 1 to 17 when added sequentially, with three left over, of course, but who is counting? It's vital that he should give Coughlin the justice he will otherwise escape. Nothing must stand in his way. It will be his ultimate sacrifice to save all the girls and women Coughlin might otherwise encounter. The burner he used to call Anderson is in the center console of his car. He pre-programmed the number for the Great Bend Police Department before he left home for what will be the last time. He makes the call at 2.15 a.m., never taking his eyes off the cone of his headlights. He doesn't have the voice-altering device he used with Anderson, so when the night dispatcher answers, Great Bend Police, how may I help? Jalbert just makes his voice a little higher. He hopes he sounds like an adolescent, but it doesn't really matter. They will respond. On calls like this, they must respond. There's going to be an explosion at the high school, a big one. It's going to happen around the time the kids start arriving. And then it just pops out. Three. Sir, where are you calling for? Three bombs he says, improvising on the fly. Three! They want to take out the whole school. Sir, Jalbert ends the call. He throws the phone out the driver's side window without slowing down. They may find the phone, and if they do, they'll find his prints when they dust it, but it doesn't matter. He won't be coming back from this, and that will be a relief. 66. When Chuck, the orderly, 
brings Danny his phone. It's 5% charged. That should be enough. Listen to me, Chuck. I want you to get the night nurses, Karen and the other one, the blonde, I can't remember her name, and go down to the second floor. What? Why? Just trust me. There isn't much time. Danny glances at the clock on his nightstand. 2.10 a.m. Chuck is still standing in the door, frowning at him. Go! It's life and death. Not kidding. You're not having a pain med reaction, are you? Belief, Danny thinks. It's all about belief, isn't it? No. Second floor. All of you. This will be over one way or the other in an hour. Until then, get out. Get safe. He goes to his contacts. For a moment, he's terrified that Davis isn't in them, that he only thought he added her number from the card she gave him. But it's there, and he makes the call, praying her phone isn't shut off. It rings four times, then five, just as he's despairing, she answers. Sleepy, she sounds more human than ever. Hello? Who? Danny Coughlin, he says. Wake up, Inspector Davis. Listen to me. I had another dream. This time it was premonitory. Do you understand? A moment's silence. When she replies, she sounds more awake. Do you mean he's coming for me? Unless something changes it, there's going to be shooting down the hall. I think at the nurse's station. Screaming. Then he's here, dressed like he was when you first came to the school. Black coat. Blue jeans. Only that time he wasn't armed. This time he is. I'll call the police, she says. But if this is some kind of weird joke... Do I sound like I'm joking? He almost screams it. The police won't come. He sent them off on some kind of wild goose chase. Don't ask me how I know that. It wasn't in the dream, but I... It's what he'd do, she says. If he really means to come after you... Yes, it's what he'd do. She sounds fully awake now. I'll call the cops in Dundee and Pawnee Rock, and then I'll come myself. I'm at my sister's, only six miles from regional. The second dream is as clear in his memory as the dream of County Road F, the Texaco station, and the constant tinka, tinka, tinka of those price signs against the rusty pole. As real as the dog and the unearthed arm, there were, will, be, Shots at the nurse's station, followed by a single scream, a man's scream, so probably Chuck the orderly. And then the man in the black coat and the dad jeans was, will be, standing in his doorway, looming in his doorway. That strange peninsular widow's peak surrounded by white skin, those deep-set, tired eyes. For poor Miss Yvonne, he'll say as he raises the gun. And just as he fires, Danny turns his head on the pillow. He looks at the clock on his night table. I told the orderly to send everyone down to the second floor, but they're not going. I can hear them down there. They don't believe me. Just like him. Just like you. He looked at the clock in his dream. He looks at it now. Forget about Dundee and Pawnee Rock, Inspector. They're too far away. He's going to start shooting at a minute to three. You've got 39 minutes to do something about it. 67. Ella's sister Regina is alone in the master bedroom. Her husband is away on one of his many business trips. Davis has her suspicions about those trips, and she supposes Regina does too, but that is a matter for another time. The digital clock beside Regina's bed reads 2.24. Reg, Reggie, wake up. Regina stirs and opens her eyes. Davis is wearing jeans, sneakers without socks, and a KU t-shirt, clearly without a bra. But it's the sight of the gun on her hip and the ID laminate her sister is slipping over her head that wakes her all the way up. What? I have to go. Right now. I'll be back before Lori wakes up. She hopes so, at least. 
There's a problem. What problem? I can't explain, Reg. I hope it's nothing. She doesn't believe that. Not anymore. She believes, Coughlin, about everything. She can only hope it's not too late. I'll call when it's taken care of. Reggie is still asking questions when her sister leaves. Ella runs down the stairs two at a time and snatches her keys from the basket by the door. Her personal car is parked in the driveway and goddamn Regina parked hers directly behind it. Davis pulls forward until the collision monitor hollers and her bumper thumps the porch. She cranks the wheel and backs around Reggie's Subaru, hitting the Subaru's bumper hard enough to rock it on its springs. She misses the mailbox by inches when she reverses into the street. She looks at the dashboard clock. It's 2.28. The streets are deserted, and she ignores the stop signs, only slowing to look for headlights coming in either direction. She takes seventh, which proves to be a mistake. There's construction. A line of smudge pots in front of a hole in the road, probably meant for a culvert. The pots glow smoky orange in the night. She wheels into someone's driveway, turns back, and takes eighth, hating the delay. She works her phone out of her pocket, and when she comes to a blinker flashing red at the McKinley Street intersection, she tells Siri to call the Great Bend PD. Davis identifies herself and tells dispatch as a possible shooter approaching regional hospital send any and all available officers. Dispatch tells her she has no one to send. Someone has phoned in a bomb threat at the high school. Three bombs, in fact, and the few officers working the night shift have gone there to close off the streets leading to the building. The bomb squad is on its way from Wichita. There's no bomb, Davis says. This guy wants to draw your cops off until he finishes what he's coming to do. Ma'am? Inspector? You know this how? The clock on her dashboard reads 239. It occurs to Ella that lack of belief is the curse of intelligence. She throws her phone on the passenger seat without ending the call and turns on to McKinley. She floors it then stamps both feet on the brake as a late-night shambler pushes a shopping cart into the street. She lays both hands on the horn. The shambler gives her a lazy middle finger, tick-tocking it from side to side as he continues on his way. Davis veers around him and tromps the gas, laying 50 feet of rubber. Here, at last, is Cleveland Street and the bulk of the hospital. The red emergency sign over the portico is her beacon, it's 2.46. Beat him, Davis thinks. If Danny was right about the time, I'd beat him. A red SUV looms up in her rear view. It swings beside her, almost sideswipes her, then bolts ahead. Davis gets just a glimpse of the driver, but a glimpse is enough. That thick widow's peak is all the ID she needs. Tail lights flash as the SUV pulls up in front of the main entrance. Jalbert gets out. Black coat, baggy dad jeans. In spite of her terror and the sense that she's having her own dream, it's hardly been an hour since she was called from a sound sleep by her phone, after all. There's a feeling of almost miraculous wonder because Danny was right break. about everything. And now she knows how he must have felt at that Texaco station, seeing his Quick dream slow. made real. She doesn't slow, simply rear-ends Jalbert's vehicle. He wheels around, eyes wide, going for his gun. Ella lays on the horn with her right hand. Wake up, you people, wake up! And opens the door with her left. She draws her own gun as she gets out, hoping two things. That she won't have to shoot her ex-partner, and that her ex-partner won't shoot her. She has a little girl to go back to. Frank? Stop. Do not go in. Ella, what are you doing here? He looks so haggard, she thinks. So lost and so dangerous. Put your gun away, Frank. People are coming out now. Nurses in pink and blue rayon. A couple of orderlies in white. A doctor in green scrubs. A couple of patients from 24-hour care. One with his arm in a sling. He's lying, Ella. Of course he is. Are you blind? 
They are pointing glocks at each other like a pair of gunfighters at the end of a Western movie. The 40 S and W ammo those guns fire will be lethal at this short range. If the shooting starts, one or both of them will almost certainly be killed. No, Frank. They caught the doer in Wyoming. His name is Andrew Iverson, yes. Jalbert is nodding. I believed that, but they were in it together. Can't you see that? Follow the logic, Ella. They were a kill team. Use your brain. How can you believe his story? You're too smart. Sixteen times too smart. Eighteen times too smart. More people have come out. They cluster on the steps. Davis wants to tell them to go back in, but she doesn't dare take her eyes off Jalbert. Now she can hear a siren. It's approaching, but it's too far, too far. Frank, why do you think I'm here? How do you think I got here? For the first time, he looks unsure. I don't know. Danny called me. He knew you were coming. He dreamed it. That's ridiculous. A lie. A fable for children. But here I am. How else can you explain it? A nurse, a large woman in a blue smock, has come out of urgent care and is now sneaking up on Jalbert from behind. Ella wants to tell her that's a bad idea, the worst idea, but doesn't dare. Jalbert will think she's trying to distract him and he'll shoot. I can't, Jalbert says. You shouldn't be here. I don't think you are here. You're a hallucin. The big woman throws her arms around Jalbert, pinning his arms. She must outweigh him by 60 pounds, but his reaction is immediate. He stamps down on one of her feet. She screams. Her grip loosens. He frees one arm and drives an elbow backward into her throat. The nurse stumbles away, gagging. He turns toward her and away from Davis. Frank, put it down. Drop it, drop it, drop it. He doesn't seem to hear her. The nurse is bent over, hands to her throat. Jalbert raises the gun. He does it very slowly. Ella has time to think about all the miles they've driven on Kansas roads and all the meals they've eaten in Kansas diners, prepping each other before testifying, sitting through endless briefings. There's time to shoot him, but she doesn't, can't. She can only watch as Jalbert continues to raise the gun but he's not pointing it at the nurse. He puts it to his own head. Frank, don't. Please don't. I did it all for poor Miss Yvonne. Then he says, three, two, one, and pulls the trigger. 68. Well, that's a better ending than I was out before. It's almost an hour later when Ella is finally allowed into Danny Coughlin's room. Two cops are standing guard outside his door. She thinks this is a perfect example of locking the barn after the horse has been stolen. Chuck, the orderly, is there, and a doctor. Ella thinks it's the one she saw on the steps during the final confrontation, but she might be wrong. They all look the same in their green scrubs. In his hospital, Johnny, Danny looks like he's lost 40 pounds. He's as haggard as Jalbert was at the end, but there's a clarity in his face that's different. Ella doesn't hesitate. She goes to him and hugs him. I'm sorry. I'm sorry about everything. It's all right, Danny tells her. He strokes her hair. That seems like the wrong thing to do. It also seems right. She pulls back from him. Ma'am, the doctor says, this man has had enough excitement for one night. He needs his rest. <laughs> Excitement, fuck me. I'll go. But Danny, why did you have that dream? Why? Do you have any idea at all? He laughs. It's a sorry laugh. Why does a man get hit by lightning twice? She shakes her head. I don't know. Neither do I. He points. I see you're wearing your cross. She touches it. I always wear it. Sure, but belief is hard, isn't it? He lies down on his pillow, puts his hands over his eyes, as if to blot out both worlds, 
the one seen and the one behind it so rarely revealed, and says it again. Belief is hard. He drops his hands. They look at each other without speaking. There's nothing to say. Finn. I don't know about you, Finn Mr. D, but I really enjoyed that story. Very beginning. He slipped through the hands of a midwife who had delivered hundreds of babies and gave his birthday cry when he hit the floor. When he was five, there was a house party next door. He was allowed out to listen to the music, the pogues blasting from pole-mounted portable speakers on his side of the street. It was summer. He was barefoot, and a cherry bomb thrown by an exuberant party-goer flew up, arced down with the stub of its fuse fizzing, and blew off the baby toe on his left foot. Wouldn't have happened again in a thousand years, his grandma said. At seven, he and his sisters so were playing in, in Pettengill uh, Park while me, grandma the sat on a nearby... Right, you've been in my stream when I've done music, and you've been in my stream tonight when I've had a story on instead. What do you actually prefer? By the way, since I've got all the base coats on, I'm going to call it a day there because I want to leave them plenty of time to cure before I put that uh, umber wash or sepia wash. I haven't decided yet on them. So after we've had a quick chat, I will probably call it a night. But as I was saying, what do you think? What do you would you what do you prefer? Do you prefer the music or do you prefer it when I put uh, a story on? It is. It's nice, isn't it? I th I like it. So let's find somebody to raid. If anybody's on, we have got. Bunker. Bunker's the only person I follow that is still online. So we will try for Bunky, who is doing a KF KFC worthy bust. We'll be going across the bunkie very soon, so I love all your faces and good night. Speak to you again soon.